Welcome to this Maxim Integrated Technical Tutorial. Today's topic is From Amplitude Modulation to Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. This tutorial is an introductory but in-depth session for a general technical audience to refresh your knowledge about the fundamentals underlying quadrature amplitude modulation. This tutorial is divided into four sections. In the first section, we'll review heterodyne amplitude modulation, or AM, and its shortcomings. Next, we'll discuss quadrature amplitude modulation, also referred to as QAM, or sometimes COM or QAM, and we'll take a look at the advantages of QAM over AM. Then we'll see how the QAM equations can be derived and generalized. Finally, we'll look at some examples of QAM modulated signals. We all carry around wireless gadgets like smartphones and smart pads that need a continuous feed of huge amounts of information to operate. This information in the form of electric signals is loaded on a carrier and sent and received across free air, a medium which is shared with other users. Thus, we find it necessary to reliably and efficiently pack and manipulate the basic information or baseband for transmission and reception. Quadrature amplitude modulation is a powerful and versatile technique, capable of packing more information in a given frequency spectrum than other techniques, which makes it a popular method for transmission of digital information. To start with, let's look at quadrature modulation's utilization in the real world. The constraints that drive wireless communications are well understood. Multiple users must be allowed to share the medium, the wireless signal must occupy a finite frequency bandwidth, and it's important to pack as much information as possible into the given bandwidth. Any wireless communication protocol must deal with these constraints. Let's start with a look at amplitude modulation with the heterodyne principle, a technique that preceded quadrature modulation. We'll see how heterodyne amplitude modulation is bandwidth inefficient calling for a better wireless communications technique. The heterodyne principle follows this formula. The product m of t of two cosinusoidal signals equals one half the sum of the two cosinusoids, a frequency equal to the sum and difference of the two original signal frequencies, where cosine omega bt represents the baseband signal, cosine omega ct represents the carrier signal, and m of t is the multiplied or mixed signal. The symbol in the circle represents the multiplier, also known as the mixer. The diagram in the middle graph shows the multiplication of two frequencies of 1 kHz and 10 kHz. These aren't exactly RF signals, but we'll use them since they simplify the example. This schematic has been simulated with Symmetrix 8.1 in the time domain and its spectrum analyzed in the frequency domain. The frequency domain simulation shows that when the carrier signal FC at 10 kHz is mixed with the information signal FB at 1 kHz, the product M of T results in an 11 kHz sinusoid, FC plus FB, and a 9 kHz sinusoid, FC minus FB. In communications, the carrier FC will be a high frequency, or radio frequency, that can be conveniently transmitted by a reasonably sized antenna. For communications, the frequency spectrum is precious real estate. From the results shown here, we see that after mixing, we get two copies of the same information, shown as two sidebands in the frequency domain, FC plus FB and FC minus FB. This raises the question, can we remove one copy and free up some of the frequency spectrum? Unfortunately, in a real-world application, the sidebands are too close to the center frequency to use a filter. So, is there another way to cancel one of the two sidebands? Let's look at how QAM solves the bandwidth problem. We can choose one of the two sidebands to remove, for example, the one on the left. How do we eliminate it given that a filter is not an option? We start with our first mixer for the cosines and add a second mixer for the signs. By subtracting the output of the second mixer, we're able to cancel out the lower sideband without using a filter. 
This is quadrature amplitude modulation as shown in equation one. Let's look at a real world example of QAM using the same input frequencies we've been working with. The circuit on the left implements the quadrature modulation equation. On the top right, the inputs of the upper mixer are shown in the time domain. At the bottom of this section, you see the 11 kHz modulated signal in the time domain. The modulated signal is shown in the spectrum at the bottom right. You can see that the modulated signal occupies a single sideband of 11 kHz. We were able to eliminate the other sideband without using a filter. Here you can see a direct comparison between the AM and QAM spectrums for the circuit we just looked at. The AM signal has a double sideband, a redundancy that uses up our precious frequency spectrum. The QAM signal has a single sideband, thus it uses bandwidth twice as efficiently. In this MATLAB simulation, we compare AM and QAM for two tones. The AM spectrum on the left shows that the transmitted signal consists of the four sidebands plus the carrier in the middle. A real AM transmitter multiplies the local oscillator signal by a magnitude between 0 and 2, with a nominal value of 1. In other words, the modulation is not allowed to go negative, since that would invert the carrier phase. In this example, you can see that amplitude modulation occupies a band of 4 kHz, while QAM occupies half as much bandwidth, only 2 kHz. Now we'll derive the QAM equations geometrically and then generalize them. We have seen that it is not efficient to transmit a single cosine i equals a cosine phi of t. We need to send along a sine as well if we want to save bandwidth. We can achieve this if we send along the entire vector, not just its projection i on the horizontal axis. The practical way to represent a vector in the physical world, such as on an oscilloscope, is through its coordinates on the Cartesian plane. i, which equals a cosine phi, is the in-phase component, q, which equals a sine phi, is the quadrature component, the vector's amplitude a is the square root of q squared plus i squared, and its tangent equals q over i, where phi can be generalized to represent phase as phi, or phase progression in time, such as omega b t, or both, where omega b is the angular frequency. And a can be a constant or a time varying signal. Now, if we rotate q i and a by a phase omega t, i assumes phase omega t, Q assumes phase omega t plus 90, A assumes phase omega t plus phi, and I and Q carry the phase information, and the tangent of phi equals Q over I. With the addition of the phase shift omega t, we impress a rotation in time on the vectors A, I, and Q. We have essentially modulated a carrier of angular frequency omega with the information in vector A. For simplicity, we have omitted the subscript C from the carrier omega C, while I and Q represent the baseband signal. Now we'll derive the first form of the QAM equation. Let's see how this representation helps us derive the law for quadrature modulation. We observe that the projection of I on the horizontal axis is I cosine omega T. And the projection of Q on the horizontal axis is minus Q sine omega T. On the other hand, the projection of A on the horizontal axis is A cosine omega t plus phi. We can see graphically that the projection on the horizontal axis of the vector A equals the sum of the projections of the vectors I and Q on the same axis. Thus graphically we have arrived at the identity A cosine omega t plus phi equals I cosine omega t minus Q sine omega t where i equals a cosine phi and q equals a sine phi. By substituting q equals a sine phi and i equals a cosine phi, we have a cosine omega t plus phi equals a cosine phi cosine omega t minus a sine phi sine omega t, which shows that in order to attribute the information contained in vector a to a carrier sine omega t, and thus obtain a sinusoidal waveform with amplitude a and phase phi, we must multiply cosine omega t by the in-phase component, a cosine phi, and multiply sine omega t by the quadrature component, a sine phi, 
then subtract the two terms. Thus, we have found a way to modulate a carrier, sine omega t, with the information of vector a. This is quadrature amplitude modulation. With quadrature amplitude modulation, we can successfully preserve and transmit the baseband information of amplitude, frequency, and phase using amplitude modulation of two orthogonal carrier sinusoids with the baseband information. If we substitute a equals 1, phi equals omega bt, and omega equals omega c, we have the same equation we used in the previous section to simulate quadrature modulation in the frequency and time domains. Here the QAM equation has been rewritten in the most general form with a time varying amplitude and phase. In this form, the equation shows the power and versatility of quadrature modulation, capable of handling amplitude, phase, and frequency modulation. In this section, we'll derive an alternative formula also used in QAM. We can observe that the projection of I on the vertical axis is I sine omega t and the projection of q on the vertical axis is q cosine omega t. On the other hand, the projection of a on the vertical axis is a sine omega t plus phi. See graphically that the projection on the vertical axis of the vector a equals the sum of the projections of the vectors i and q on that same axis. Thus graphically we have arrived at the identity a sine omega t plus phi equals i sine omega t plus q cosine omega t, where the amplitude of a equals the square root of i squared plus q squared, the tangent of phi equals q over i, q equals a sine phi, and i equals a cosine phi. By substituting q equals a sine phi and i equals a cosine phi, we have a sine omega t plus phi equals a cosine phi sine omega t plus a sine phi cosine omega t, which shows that in order to attribute the information of vector a to a carrier sine omega t and thus obtain a sinusoidal waveform with am amplitude a and phase phi, we must multiply sine omega t by the in-phase component a cosine phi, we multiply cosine omega t by the quadrature component a sine phi, and then sum the two terms. We have thus found another way to modulate a carrier sine omega t with the information of vector a. This is the alternative quadrature amplitude modulation equation. Here the QAM equation has been rewritten in the most general form with time varying amplitude and phase. In this form the equation shows the power and versatility of quadrature modulation capable of handling amplitude, phase, and frequency modulation. Here we see an illustration of quadrature modulation in the time domain for the case where q and i both equal 1. Let's look at a few examples of modulated waveforms. Here we have two cases of modulated signals, phase modulation and frequency modulation. These waveforms were obtained using Wolfram Alpha. Here we have two cases of amplitude modulated signals, again obtained with Wolfram Alpha. It's always a good idea to visualize these in the time domain. Let's summarize what we've learned. We have discussed heterodyne amplitude modulation and its inefficiency in terms of the frequency spectrum. The search for a more efficient algorithm took us to quadrature modulation. We saw that quadrature amplitude modulation delivers the same information in half the frequency compared to heterodyne amplitude modulation. We derived geometrically two alternative equations describing quadrature amplitude modulation. And finally, we reviewed some typical phase, frequency, and amplitude modulated waveforms. To find information on wireless communication ICs, which utilize QAM modulation, visit our website at maximintegrated.com slash QAM. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.